Good afternoon. Welcome to our seminar um, today being given by Ryan Neely, who's been visiting us for the last two weeks. Um, first thing you learn about Ryan Neely is that he likes to be called by his last name, Neely. So I like to call him by his first two names, Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> when I first met him, um, it seemed like he was following my own career and, and that we had working with a lot of the same people and he seemed to be following me around where he was working. <clears throat> but then I, I realized I was just paranoid because uh, I think a lot of people feel that way because he has his hands in so many pots. He's pretty much doing everything <clears throat> that he can. Um, he, uh, he graduated from high school in 2005. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and was awarded a scholarship to go to North Carolina State, State. University. NC State. Yeah. Um, where he graduated summa cum laude, and then he came here to University of Colorado to do graduate work. Is that right? Yeah, I yeah. think so. <laughs> Whatever that was. Worked with a number of people at NOAA, uh, Susan Solomon and Dave Hoffman, and uh, worked with Brian Toon at the university, and then um, he got an ASP postdoc here, where he was uh, for a brief period before <laughs> heading off to England, where he is now um, the University of Leeds and the National <coughs> Center for Atmospheric Science, that's center with an RE. And um, he's, he's been working on modeling stratospheric aerosol as well as measuring uh, with laser beams, with remote sensors, um, and uh, that's what he's going to be talking about the, the last part with us today. So go ahead. All right. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, thank you for letting me give a talk today. This is the end of a really amazing two-week trip with um, hanging out with ACOM. I've been really busy with those guys, so I apologize if this is a little rougher than it would normally be. I also apologize for the schizophrenic spelling. So I've only been in the UK for about two and a half years, so I've tried to change all of my Zs to Ss, and there are all sorts of RE issues. And let's just say I understand Dan Marsh better than I want to. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so as Mike mentioned, I do a, quite a, a crazy array of things, uh, but they all sit around doing remote sensing, so using radar and LIDAR um, in new and different ways to get at uh, measuring aerosols and clouds um, and comparing that to models. So this is probably the first talk ever I've given at NCAR where I'm not really going to mention volcanoes much, even though that's why I came for the last two weeks to work with Mike and the, the guys in ACON, the Wacom group, um, and we, that's been a, a lot of fun. Uh, but today, I, I'm going to speak about some of the, more of my current work and where my efforts are when I'm back in the UK of looking at LIDAR over Greenland and some ra uh, radar measurements. So uh, the first topic I'll talk about uh, after I get through some intro background information will be um, my polarization LIDAR in Summit Greenland called Capable. And actually, this was helped built by Matt Heyman, who's sitting in the audience here he, I remember when we were both in grad school and is still going strong. Um, and I got to talk a little generally about the results from that work, including some very new stuff that I got uh, emailed by uh, grad student Robert Stillwell yesterday. So some really exciting results. Uh, and then I'm going to touch on some results um, from a project called Ice D. So it's the UK Ice and Clouds Experiment Dust, and this is uh, part of it. You know, it's part of this family of ice experiments, and a lot of people here at NCAR have been involved with that. Andy Heimsfeld, especially, was working with Alan Blythe. And really, my part in this larger project was to run uh, or work with our mobile radar. And that's the new instrument that I'm a PI of at NCAS and in uh, Leeds. Um, and this was a huge project I'll talk more about later. But uh, it also involved our FAM aircraft, the BA-146. So but really, this is, this is what I uh, consider the center of my research, is how do you actually measure clouds and precipitation as well as aerosols accurately and how do you do that um, and why do we care well in the short term this is a slide I put together um, for you know motivating people in the UK is you know flooding this was storm Desmond and it you know had a huge impact uh, last year across the UK and there was this flooding across the entire country and had you know pensioners swimming in their kitchens and it was this 
a big problem, and it probably could have been avoided if there had been some better observations. Um, but more in the long term as well, you know, being able to measure clouds and precipitation and cloud phase accurately is important for understanding the dynamics of our polar ice sheets. So we've been making measurements in Greenland of uh, precipitation uh, and clouds as they both affect the mass budget and the energy budget of, of the ice sheets. And I'm hopefully going to be extending some of these measurements down to Antarctica very soon. Uh, but you can see you know, the effect that the Greenland ice sheet by itself may have on our, our future planet. So let's just get into it, though. Um, what are the issues with being able to do this? Why is this so hard? Why, why is it hard to tell uh, what is, what's comprised of a cloud? How why, is it ice? Is it liquid? What are these problems? Um, and that's really the, the order one thing that I've been looking at with my research. And I don't know if we'll ever get past it. And that's because you know, clouds and precipitation come in so many varieties. There's just so many things to see in the atmosphere. So I mean, this is just a, a selection I've pulled from different research papers. And you can see you know, even a simple raindrop changes as it falls through the atmosphere and balloons out and explodes into a bunch of smaller drops. How do you quantify that? How do you actually measure that and tell the difference between something like that versus some of these very complex ice crystals? I just find that really fascinating. And it's really important to be able to tell the difference between that to start understanding processes. So I've stolen this, this spaghetti diagram from Morrison's paper in 2012. And I, I don't want to get into the details of it. But the point of what I'm trying to highlight here is that understanding phase is central to understanding the rest of all these processes. You need to know what phase the, the, the water is in before you can start to disentangle how these effects are, are changing the dynamics of the cloud and at the surface. Uh, so, you know, if we can ever get past number one, I think, you know, the next thing that's really important in my research right now, and I have a lot of effort going on, is actually identifying specific hydrometeor populations and so moving beyond just ice versus liquid, but actually being able to say something a little more detailed you know, and looking at large populations of these things in clouds. And a lot of this applies as well to aerosols. So I, I'm showing lots of precipitation here, but doing this with aerosols is also particularly important in our work. Um, and then, you know, so, you know, going from something like that and understanding it in a kind of dynamical sense where you have, you know, advection of cold and warm air underneath clouds and, you know, as it precipitates, you can have a continuum of rain to snow. And it's really important, especially when making weather forecasts of what type of precipitation is actually making at the surface. And I have a grad student right now who's thinking about this hard with looking at the UK radars. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and finally, so if we can actually do all of that um, and get down to it, we'd actually like to put some numbers. A lot of this is real qualitative and being able to you know, say what parts of clouds look like what. But being able to actually put some rates to it is the, you know, the ultimate goal uh, and be able to do that in real time with remote sensing technology. So that's, that's the real thing. That's where the ultimate goal of my research is going. Um, and just to highlight that, so this is a study done by Lewis in 2015, where he looked at radar observations versus the UKV, which is their high resolution forecast model. And they looked at the, they compared the difference between accumulation. So this is over three months of radar observations and model runs. And they compared the two. And you can see there's huge differences. But I can't tell you where those differences are coming from. Is it because the radar retrievals are horrible, or is it because the model has biases? Uh, and there's a lot of white space on that plot, too. And that's just because there's the comparison between the radar and the model couldn't be done because there was such poor quality in the radar data. Um, so it's really, you know, this is huge motivation for being able to improve our observations and use all the information we have available to us from them. All right, so how do we actually do something like this? How do we discern some information from all this complexity in the atmosphere? Um, and you probably could tell from the name of my talk that I think you know, using polarized active remote sensing is the answer. Uh, that's really where my uh, research centers around, though I do a little bit of Raman remote sensing as well. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, I want to talk a little bit about polarization. Um, I've actually been to Greenland many, many times and never seen a polar bear. So this is, this is not my own photo. I've stolen this from someone. It's still a goal in my life to see some polar bears before they're all gone. Um, and I actually recently gave a talk in uh, the University of Edinburgh. So I had to go back all the way to Maxwell's equations. But I'm not going to go over this today. I just had to throw this up there when I was at, you know, standing in Maxwell's house in, in, a, in a physics uh, room where, where they were printed on the floor. Um, but I'm hoping that you all know that polarization is really 
when I say that, what I'm talking about is the direction of the electric vector and the magnetic wave, so the electromagnetic wave. Uh, and that's really what we're talking about. Where is that pointing as this wave of light propagates through the atmosphere? Uh, but why do we care? Well, what we care about is that different polarizations interact with matter differently. I mean, that's kind of a silly statement to say. You guys can all see this in your daily lives. If you have sunglasses you can put on, you go outside with the polarized sunglasses and tilt your head different ways, and you can see different information in the atmosphere. Uh, and I, I, I love showing this, this picture because it's, it's the details, I mean, it's the same scene, but the clouds just pop out so much more beautifully when you put the polarizers on there. All right, so, all right, so we have this phenomenon of polarization. How do we actually use it to make some observations and get some information out? Um, well, as with all remote sensing, um, you, you're, you know, this is a technology-driven research, um, and, it's, and you have to have many systems working together, and plus um, some pretty intelligent data analysis to actually getting information out of it. And it all starts with having a radiation source that you know very well, and you characterize it, be it a single or dual polarized source or multiple polarizations. You know what that is, and you send it out. It propagates through the atmosphere, and it interacts with some object in the atmosphere. Um, and that causes the polarization state to change, and then the reverse, you go back through the atmosphere to what, some receiver that you have set up, and hopefully you can take that information and pull out what you want to know about the clouds. Um, so there's a lot of research in our group and the people I've worked with throughout the years on both sides of these and developing better radiation sources and controlling them and knowing them better, but also improving receiver designs and actually being able to pull more information out of the signals. Uh, and then to all make this all happen, actually have a, a robust instrument that you can leave and actually collect lots of data, there's a lot of work that goes into actually controlling these things and making a system that can actually be out there for years at a time and be able to build up statistics on these clouds and aerosols that we're observing. Um, but when you boil down to the math, this is what we're actually doing. We're sending out a vector of light, a Stokes vector out. Uh, is having some stuff done to it, which is represented by this 4x4 four four Mueller matrix. So it's a scattering matrix, and you can do um, your linear algebra and add or put many of those together in line to describe different parts of that process that I just sent you or showed you. And then you have a Stokes vector that comes back that you measure. And that's all we're really doing. That's it's an amazing process, and, and when you start looking at it mathematically. Um, and just to give you an example of two Mueller matrices, so this is from a, a paper uh, looking at um, hexagonal columns versus hexagonal plates. And you have two Mueller matrices side, with all the elements side by side. So this is, this is the column, this is the plate. You can start to see there's, you know, these elements have different things going on in them. And you can start to see that possibly you can pull out enough information to tell the difference between these two types of ice crystals. And that's the beauty of this. This using polarizations, that you have all this information in these matrices that you can start to identify what is going on in the atmosphere. All right, so now I hope I've kind of convinced you and shown you the method a little bit. Um, and I'm going to show you some examples of where we've used polarization in sort of novel ways um, to make some interesting measurements. Um, and though this, I've, I've had this cartoon on my slides for a long, long time, and I think. At this point in history, it was the most polarized. So this is not this was not a political statement. I'm so <laughs> I didn't mean you know polarized has taken on a whole new word lately, both in the U.S. and the U.K. Um, all right. So what I'm going to show you is an example. Um, and this this research started way back in my grad work uh, with Matt Heyman. Um, we were trying to see if we could use a lidar to observe horizontally oriented ice crystals or HOIC. And you know, the big question was, it's always been, it still is, do oriented ice crystals matter? Um, I mean, if you have random orientation, you have you know, short wave and long wave radiation coming from different directions, and it gets scattered off into different places. But when you have prefer uh, preferential orientation, it's like you have a bunch of mirrors in the atmosphere. So you think all the short wave would go back out in the space, and all the long wave would go back and warm um, more efficiently. And does that actually have any meaning in the, you know, the global context of the energy balance? I don't, you know, nobody knows that. I, it's still a big question, even with the satellite observations from Calypso that are going on. Um, but we, I think we came up with a really good system, which I mentioned, capable as part of this larger project called ICECAP, so the Integrated Characterization of Energy, Clouds, and Atmospheric State and Precipitation at Summit. So let me tell you, that took a long time to get a nice name that would go well with this project. Um, 
And this has been a work with Matt Shoup, Dave Turner, Von Walden, and others. It's a huge team of people where we put this observatory on top of the Greenland ice sheet, and it's been there since 2011. And we're going to go for at least another year and possibly two more. So we have a huge amount of data. If people want to talk about that to compare it to other things, come find me later, and I can put you in touch with the different data streams. So as I mentioned, this is at the top of the Greenland ice sheet. Um, we're in the NSS mobile science facility at Summit Camp. You can see it over there. Um, and it's at 3.2 kilometers. It's 400 kilometers from the coast. And you really only get in and out during the summertime, though there are people that fly in on smaller twin otters uh, in the winter. There are actually people there changing crew right now. So there are only five people in the winter uh, for three months at a time. So you're really, it's a really harsh place to make measurements. It's really hard. You, you really just have to think about it like you're in space. Um, and, but it became really pertinent recently. So this was really amazing. We were there at the right time. Um, in July 2012, the entire Greenland ice sheet melted, the entire surface. So there's melting of the Greenland ice sheet typically throughout the summer at the lower elevations along its edge and down towards the south here. Uh, but in July 2012, there's a certain synoptic condition that caused a huge amount of heat to be advected over the ice sheet. And satellite sensors measured melting, which is indicated by red and orange here, across the entire sheet. Um, and this was a unique phenomenon. And it almost occurred again later in the month. And we had never seen this before. It, never, it had never been observed um, in modern times. And that's according to ice cores that you can see these melt events really come. The layers look distinct compared to other, other years. Um, so why did that happen? What, what is going on? Why, why did this occur? And what we found in the study is that it was just subtle changes in the microphysics led to these huge changes in the surface energy balance. Um, so I, I don't want to go into this too much detail because I have a lot to talk about today. But the point is here that we, we ran a simple energy balance model uh, and went through a couple different uh, conditions. So there's one where we have no solar radiation. So um, obviously, we don't quite make it above a freezing. So this is temperature on this side, and that solid line at the top is the freezing point. Um, and then we ran it again where we had no liquid clouds. And again, it didn't quite get the freezing. And then we ran it again with some really thick clouds. So the thickest clouds we observed in Greenland with the liquid water path of you know, 500 grams per meter squared. And that, again, we didn't get the melting. But if we actually ran it with the observed fluxes, uh, of these specific clouds. They were only about 30 to 40 uh, liquid water, uh, 30 to 40 grams per meter squared. Um, we actually were able to push our surface energy balance model above freezing as was observed in Greenland. So it's having these really specific type of clouds, which are actually really hard to model in something like WARF or CAM. Um, uh, and it was only with their present where we were able to actually see the melting. So this shows you accurately attributing cloud phase was crucial to be able to understand these. Because a lot of the sensors on the ground actually see these clouds as either not existing or as ice because of the way they look to different wavelengths. And being able to actually use a LIDAR to accurately show how thick these clouds are and how much liquid is was key to this study. So how do we actually observe this? I've kind of mentioned it a little bit. Um, so that building, we have this stuff full of an array of remote sensors. So it's very similar to a, a one of the ARM setups, but I'll just go through. We have precept sensors, we have microwave radiometers, we have a radar, cloud radar, um, a sealometer, a sonar is out there in the backyard, as we call it. And then inside, we have uh, polarization LIDAR. So there's two. There's The one in the back is capable, and then we have an MPL, and we have a spectral infrared interferometer. Um, and we have all these servers and things that are making sure everything's being taken care of and sending the data back. And the other big thing is that we launch radio sounds twice a day. And this goes into the, the, the global database as well. So that's actually helping forecast models as we speak. Um, so that's the array of instruments we have. And what it produces is an amazing holistic picture from, of the clouds that pass over the summit. So here I'm just showing you a few of the data streams uh, where we have the radar on top. So you can see these big ice clouds. And there's a liquid stratiform cloud coming through. And then we have a LIDAR, the MPL here. And I know you can't see the details in the back, but we're going to focus in on capable's measurement here of diattenuation. And, you know, and for the boundary layer, we actually have these SODAR measurements. So this is only up to 15 meters, and these are precipitation. So you can see you know, the wealth of information we're getting, and you can imagine what this type of science we can do with it. Um, and the other thing, and this is, I think, crucial to what we're doing, is we also make uh, collect ice crystals when we can. So we get the tech to go outside and collect these on slides and actually measure 
and take pictures of what the crystals are when they hit the surface. This is really labor intensive and it doesn't happen all the time, but when it does, it is very valuable. And we've actually observed um, all sorts of different types of ice that you wouldn't expect in this, these conditions. It's ice that you would only sort of expect in the tropical tropopause, but we're actually seeing trigonal ice here as well. So this is a, so the ice caused by stacking disorder. Now, a colleague of mine, Ben Murray, did a study on that just based on these observations from Summit. So this is the instrument uh, I've been working with since grad school. It's changed over the years uh, quite a bit um, just from work that Matt has done and told us where we need to actually point the, the LIDAR differently and do different things to it. And we've gotten better um, uh, data acquisition systems. Um, but at its heart, it's always been a multiple linear polarization measurement. So we send out one polarization and then we make many uh, measurements on the way back. So we have a single receiver that we rotate the polarization that we actually observe um, coming back into the measurement. And currently, we're running at 24 meters and 15 second temporal resolution. It's running 24 seven. Um, and I used to be able to control it from the iPhone, but Robert Stuhl recently took this uh, ability away from me because he told me to stop playing with it. So um, we can still remotely control it though, if I get the password from him. Um, yeah. Um, so this is a picture of cable in the winter. It's spectacular. The text up there to take these uh, long uh, integration photos, and you can see the laser beam coming out of the building, uh, and with the aurora in the background. It's just I, I would love to be up there in the winter time and see this. Um, and so this is the math behind what capable is actually measuring. So we, because we may make multiple linear polarization measurements, we can do more than measure just the traditional depolarization measurement that you get from a, a LIDAR like an MPL. And what we're actually doing is probing the scattering matrix at different places. Um, so we're actually getting the backscatter efficiency, we're getting a thermodynamic phase on the F33 term, and then we're measuring this preferential orientation term. So this is off-diagonal term that most LIDARs can't actually get to. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, so preferential orientation, that term, that F12 term, is also called diattenuation. Um, and you may have not have heard this. this is a, it's a less known polarization term. Uh, but really what it is is that you have many, it, it, it's, it's a property of the object that's doing the scattering. And so in, in that object can interact with all sorts of different types of polarizations, but really it likes to scatter polarization in, in, one, in one plane. It has a preferred polarization that it scatters to. Um, so it's a really unique uh, type of property of some um, materials, uh, but most importantly, it's a property that oriented ice crystals exhibit. So this is a pretty typical day in the summertime at Summit. And this is really, this, you know, I, I, I've been up to Summit a couple of times, and it was pictures like these that made me think that, can we actually quantify this? How do we actually go after this and actually say how many ice crystals are out there? Um, because these pictures are great, but I don't really know what it means in terms of the radiation budget. Um, so just digging into details a little bit more. Um, so traditional orthogonal polarization measurements do this. They have this delta term where you have the number of uh, photons at the perpendicular plane of polarization over the parallel plane. Um, and that's great. You get some information. You can tell you know, the difference between liquid and randomly oriented ice. But you can't really tell anything about the orientation of the ice. Um, and there are some issues and some very subtle issues that we've been thinking about in terms of dynamic range because the parallel signal, as represented by this vector, is, is huge compared to the perpendicular signal. And that makes the measurement very hard because of the signal noise issues that you could come, or come along with that. Um, so more recently, uh, in conjunction with Matt's work and some other people, Robert has been pushing this on capable uh, where he has done these non-orthogonal retrievals. Because you can actually measure these diagonal terms, so the dipoles, so the, you know, the, the pink ones here. FII terms, the delta terms, uh, in many different ways. You don't have to actually do, just use a, the perpendicular over the parallel. Um, and so if you measure more than two planes of polarization, you open up to your, your ability to actually match your signal strengths. So you have a whole array of signal strengths to the objects you're measuring, so low clouds or high clouds. But then it also lets you measure your orientation. So doing this, it, just, it, it enhances your polarization measurements and lets you get around things like um, unambiguously determining liquid versus ice. So I'm going to show you an example of that. This is just a typical profile from Summit. 
So this is our depolarization. So if you just had a depolarization LIDAR, this is what you would see. Uh, you have high depolarization going up in altitude, and you would say this is like ice precipitation, and there's low depol up here, so maybe this is a mixed phase cloud or some got some liquid in it. Um, that's all you know, that's all you can say. But if you actually measure the dye attenuation, what you actually see is that this area is also ice, it just happens to be horizontally oriented, and because it's horizontally oriented, it's filling your depolarization ratio, your traditional depolarization ratio, into making it look like it's a low value and, was, and is improperly classifying it as liquid. So this is another effect of being able to measure more polarization and get more information out of the scattering matrix. So I could go on and talk about this a lot. I'm not going to. I've stolen this, this slide from Robert. Uh, if you want to think about you know, the retrievals and how we're doing this, I suggest you go see this new paper that he just submitted uh, where we go over this whole um, issue of different signal strengths and having the best guess from your polarization LIDAR. I think he's got a really great technique there. Um, but I'm just going to show you the results from it. Um, and I'm going to briefly go over it. So, so these are the things we're retrieving from our signals, and it's just a, an example. So we get total backscatter, and you can see you know, you have a bright band through here that is a really a stratiform cloud. You have some precip, and there's an ice cloud later in the day. And that's supported by the depolarization measure. We have low depol, ice is falling out of it, high depol, and you have these areas of high ice reflectivity here. Um, this is the dye attenuation. There's nothing much going on this day. We didn't have any oriented ice crystals. Um, and we use that information to come down and make a data mask that so we can actually classify what we're seeing as liquid, ice, or clear air, and also some oriented ice crystals. And you'll see more of that later. Um, but I actually dug up this really old slide. Uh, I realized that I was going through when I was prepping for this that it's almost been five years to the day so that we first made our um, what we call our, our initial observation of horizontally oriented ice crystals. Uh, we had started this work um, probably a, a, two, a year or two earlier, and we had gone through a lot of issues of actually what are our signals meaning. Uh, and I think this was the first observation that we conclusively said we observed horizontally oriented ice crystals. So you can see that I have linear dye attenuation at the top, and we have some pretty strong values out of the noise that are these light blue colors. And they're occurring in two places. They're up, up high in the cirrus cloud, where we expected to see it. We don't have much turbulence going on. You, you, would, you would think you would have oriented ice crystals. But then down lower, and we have the, on the edge of the stratiform cloud that you can see that's forming here. We have this it's an ice cloud, the edge of this cloud, and it's got oriented crystals, but then all of a sudden they disappear. There must be more turbulence or something going on in there. And this was, this was published in the first paper on Capable. Um, and since then, we've been able to make, you know, we've had issues with being able to prove what we're observing is actually oriented or not. Um, it's, it's really hard to go up there and actually watch the crystals and see what they're doing. Um, so we've been scratching our heads and thinking about how can we use different sensors to show this. And uh, most recently, we've come up with some pictures that look like this. And this is pretty spectacular. So these were taken uh, last December, and I believe people had seen it before. But what it is is a specular reflection from ice crystals um, falling behind the building where we have our LIDAR. So the LIDAR beam is coming from where you guys are sitting, and it's going up into the atmosphere, and it's lightly snowing, and you're getting these reflections on the surface. And what's spectacular about these is that you can see all these different types of patterns. And it, you know, it looks a lot like spore scattering patterns that people use to help classify different aerosols and particle drops and things like that. So what we did was we teamed up with a group at the University of Hertfordshire and did some um, pretty sophisticated scattering modeling of these 2D patterns. So we pulled out from those pictures that our technicians in Greenland took some of the more um, spectacular patterns and we did a whole array of, of modeling of these reflections and came up with some parameters um, of what would have caused that type of reflection. Um, and what we see, and you can, this is an example, so these are the observed patterns, these are the modeled patterns, and these are the, the, the ice crystal shape. This is on top, the side, and kind of a perspective view of the different crystals that made this. Uh, and the other parameter that is not shown here, but it's in the words over here, is the, is the tilt of the, of the ice crystal. Uh, and that's really important for these, making these images on the ground. And there were a significant fraction of these that were actually horizontally oriented in place, just as we had imagined and proposed that that would be causing dye attenuation. 
So you're probably wondering, did Capable actually see oriented ice crystals during that period? And we did. Um, so this is the backscatter ratio, depolarization ratio, uh, the diattenuation. You can see you have very high diattenuation here, here with these red colors. And with our data mask, we can actually see we have very large pockets of oriented ice crystals. It's a little hard to see on the screen, but out throughout the whole day, there was a significant portion of ice crystals that were oriented and observed by Capable. So this was a really great um, collaboration uh, and be able to show that you know from two different ways, it's completely different methods of observing oriented ice crystals, and they agree. So back to this question, are they important? Have we, have, have we gotten to that? So we know we can observe these things uh, with some confidence. Um, and you know, so what can we do? So we've been measuring for a long time. We've been doing this since 2012. But we have actually now built a climatology, and I have a student that's worked through that and the statistics of that, and there, it's just submitted a paper. Um, but I thought I'd jump a little ahead to <clears throat> some of Robert's most recent results from last night, where we've combined his masking ability with uh, up and down um, flux, me or, so flux measurements from the surface at some, so long wave and short wave flux measurements. And he gets to the fact that we actually do see a significant effect from clouds with orange ice crystals. So let me walk you through this. Um, so here we have downwelling long wave cloud radio forcing. So the clear sky has been subtracted from each of these. And in the green line uh, is clear sky, ice um, is in red, the blue is water, and HOIC is in black. Um, and this is the downwelling short wave, and this is the upwelling short wave. And what you can notice is that the, the ice clouds uh, here have, don't have a significant downwelling long wave effect, whereas it's pushed over to actually having a warming effect when you have HOIC present in a cloud. Um, and again, with the downwelling short wave, we're actually seeing much more scattering from the black line here in both the up and down for clouds that have HOIC versus ones that are only randomly oriented. So that's pretty, that's, we're finally getting to be able to answer this question that I think Matt and I started to work on about five or six years ago. So and this is, we're getting into, it's quite complicated because of where Summit is um, and the solar zenith angle. Sometimes the sun is actually below the cloud. Here I'm only showing 75, the solar zenith angle is 75 degrees and higher. And I should also mention that these PDFs are normalized. So Actually, in fact, you know, oriented ice crystals only occur about 1.5% of the time in all our observations. Um, but uh, when they do occur, they have a much more significant effect than any of the rest of the ice. All right. Uh, I'm going to switch topics a little bit. We're going to go a longer wavelengths now. And I'm going to talk about some of my work in the UK. It's all related, because what we're doing is using polarization to understand what's going on in clouds. Um, here, we're mostly trying to understand what's actually how what's going on up in the cloud is impacting the surface and how we can help improve observations that will go into flood forecasting. Um, and again, I'll bring up this slide to remind you, you know, the issues here. Um, but, and this, uh, this is a horrible slide because I have lots and lots of words, but that's the point is just to overwhelm you with words because these are all the issues with making radar observations. There's tons and tons of problems with actually going from the radar and actually pulling out a rainfall estimate. Um, and what I'm going to show, you, uh, talk about um, is how can dual polarization radar actually improve upon these. And it, it, it can improve on many of them. So I have four highlighted here. But the one I want to talk about is actually hydrometer classification, some work we're doing on that, which is very similar to what we're doing with capable, but it's just using a uh, different wavelength. And how that hopefully the ultimate goal of that is actually use this information to know what type of precipitation we're looking at and improve rainfall estimation. Um, so, so like the LIDAR with the Mueller Mate that I showed you earlier, there's a wealth of information coming from these radar observations. And I'm just showing a few things here that are my favorite. So and to, instead of just measuring the, the scatter that's coming back and the intensity, uh, dual polarization radar lets you, it shoots out two polarizations and you can compare those when they come back. You can compare the intensity they come back, or you can compare the relative phase of those two signals. And you can pull out all sorts of different parameters. And, and, and that's, you know, that's not what I want to 
point at here. The, what I really care about is, you know, what did they actually tell me? So we can measure differential reflectivity. It tells us something about the shape. We can measure uh, differential propagation of the phase shift, and that gives you number concentration and size. And then you can also measure copolar co correlation, uh, rho HV, as it usually calls. And that talks about, it gives you some information about the orientation and the types and the shapes. So you can take all this sort of information, and it's similar to what we're doing with the LIDAR, and actually come up with you know, what type of particles are we looking at, and how are they falling, and what is going on in the cloud. So just to show you an example with ZDR, um, as I told you, it, it's, it's, the ZDR values uh, reflect the shape of the particle. But it's also indicative of the size of the raindrop, because as rain falls, it balloons out and flattens out like this. So you can see, as you, you get bigger particles, you're going to have a much larger ZDR value, uh, and vice versa. So, and I don't want to get into the, the nitpicky bit of this. Uh, I just wanted to kind of give you a flavor of what you can do with it. Uh, because one of the amazing things about moving to the UK is that I've been given access to a lot of instruments um, to come to bear on this problem. So I'm the PI of this guy over here, this the mobile uh, X-band radar, the NX pole, as we've now named it. Um, but also within NCAS in the UK, we have the Chibolton Observatory. So this is a 25 meter dish. This is the S-band radar. This is big enough for a person to stand up in. So it's 10 times the size of the X-band radar. It is not mobile. It's a battleship. It stays there. Um, and, but we also have a new KA cloud band radar. And we have, uh, that's up the observatory. It's mobile as well. And we have two other um, cloud radars um, at the observatory. So we have a multitude of wavelengths, and they're all polar metric, and we're all looking at the same cloud. So we, you can imagine you know, the information I showed you with the polarization times four or five with different wavelengths really lets you start probing uh, the processes in these clouds pretty specifically. And this is all within a context of this map right here. So the UK Met Office is upgrading their network to dual polarization. They've been doing this for the last couple of years, and they'll be done this year or early next year, there are only a few more radars that have been doing it kind of one at a time so they don't lose coverage, too much coverage. And this is including the Irish radars and the Jersey radar as well as part of this network. They're not all owned by England um, or Scotland, sorry. I get in trouble. Um, Dan's laughing. Um, all right, so, but the main focus on my research is the instrument I'm a PI of. This is the X band radar. Um, this is a picture of it from Cape Verde with the FAM aircraft. I mean, this is kind of the ideal scenario when we have the aircraft flying around making in situ observations that tell us if our retrievals are believable or not. Um, this is just a sample of you know, rain coming over at Cape Verde. Um, so it's an X band, three centimeter wavelength, dual, dop dual pole Doppler. Uh, and we have a, no radome because our dish is actually quite big. It's a Celex radar, but it's a non standard radar because we have a 2.4 meter antenna. And because of that, we, they couldn't fit a radome on the trailer. Um, so that's good and bad. When it gets too windy, we have to turn it off. But it also means we don't have to worry about having a radome and having the attenuation effects of that. And we actually, and <coughs> uniquely, we can scan pretty quickly um, compared to some other radars. Um, so we actually can get, um, you know, depending on what type of data quality you want, you can actually make volumes and look at things in rapid refresh. So let me just, I want to show you an example uh, of using the radar and actually getting into doing some of this hydrometer classification work. Uh, and this comes from observations that were made in ICE-D. Um, and this was a huge project uh, with a whole load of collaborators. I'm just listing them here. It was led by NCAS, really, Alan Blythe, uh, and people at the UK uh, Met Office. Um, but it included all these other folks. And if you don't know where Cape Verde is, it's, it's, it's right where hurricanes form. Pretty much, I'm looking at Chris. <laughs> um, and we almost saw one. We had to leave the day before. We were this close. It was probably good, because I was worried about the radar at the point. Um, um, but because what we were there for is the interactions between dust and clouds. And this is a the two different satellite images. And you can see the clouds here, and the reds and oranges. And there's these pinky colors that aren't showing up too well, which is the dust. and you know, here is Praia, where we had the radar, and you know, kind of FAM's circle of, of where it was able to go and fly around. That was a, kind of our playground. Uh, and we were trying to look at these interactions in the different layers and how you know, the dust would impact ice formation in clouds specifically. Um, and one of the reasons why I mentioned ZDR earlier is because 
there's been uh, several papers um, by uh, Matt Coomgen and other people. Matt Coomgen was at ASP when I was here as well, um, who are looking at these uh, ZDR columns. So this is a observation that you, you see uh, when you get big thunderstorms. You're looking at dual pole radar data. So this is re this is just normal reflectivity. So the intensity of what you get getting back, and this is ZDR. And you see you have these huge spikes going well above the freezing level here. Um, and those are known as ZDR columns, so positive values of ZDR reaching above the, the melting point. And they're indicative of supercooled liquid drops. So you're getting liquid above the freezing level. And you can, have an, you can imagine that has a really Im big impact on the microphysics of the storm. Um, and if aerosols were around, would they impact the formation of these columns? Is there something going on there? And that was, kind of, that was this kind of smaller question that I've been going after with the ICD data. Um, and this is not this is not quality control data. This is a, a quick plot. So there's some issues in this data, but I just want to show you this is one of the more intense storms that came through. Um, it was a, a quick movie I was able to put together last night, um, and I'm going to show you an example of what's going on within this little box here. If you're if you're adept at looking at radar data, though, um, you'll see the whole thing kind of blinks. The storm was so strong that it almost attenuated. It just did it there, our entire radar. Um, and so, and let's move on to what this looks like. So, so what I was showing you before was a PPI. So that was a horizontal view of the storm coming across. And when we were in Cape Verde, we actually collected a series of PPIs that went up in the atmosphere. So we collected uh, up angles, and we created a whole volume of the atmosphere around us. And that's what this is showing you. And I'm showing you several different um, observations from the radar. So we have the reflectivity at the top, the ZDR, and then these other things that I've mentioned. And I, I won't get into it unless you have questions. At the bottom there, this is the Doppler winds. Um, I'm going to pause this because it's really hard to see unless you slow it down. Uh, so in the radar observations, you can see there's a band there. We call that the melting layer. And then right behind it are these ZDR values. And they're sticking up above the melting layer. And that's what we're after. So um, unfortunately, the FAM aircraft had broken that day, so we didn't have in situ observations. Um, it was really hard to, to actually get the aircraft to get coincidental measurements with the radar during this. Um, I hope we can go back and do ICD2. I think we learned a lot about how to actually make these measurements. Uh, during the trip. Um, and we also didn't have radio sounds that day, uh, but the wharf modeling suggested that, you know, you know, that's the melting level was about six kilometers, or sorry, the temperature at six kilometers was about negative eight. So this is just prime ZDR uh, observations. So it's nothing as intense as Matt or others have seen happening in the continental US. Um, and so it's, it's a little, it's these maritime ZDR columns are slightly different in trying to understand what they're doing and how the dust on this day impacted that. And I haven't quite gotten there yet, because um, I'm still working on implementing a hydrometer classification algorithm uh, for the X-band. And I'm doing that in collaboration with people here at EOL using the LROSE software, which is fabulous. Um, here I'm just showing an example from a, a paper by Thompson et al, uh, where they had done this with the X-band radar up in uh, CSU. So you can see they're taking these different radar values and uh, similar to how we did with the LIDAR and making this data math scheme where you can see different types of rain versus freezing rain and aggregates and snow, wet, wet snow, dry snow, ice crystals. Uh, and that's kind of the goal, what we want to do with our data. And we do that. Um, it gets, it gets, it's quite complicated. And how do you actually combine all that information in the best way possible? Um, and we, well, the, the method we've chosen is to use fuzzy logic. So we take the radar observations and we give them some sort of membership function, and we compare all that and give it a score, and then it comes out with the best guess of what the, the radar was actually seeing based on scattering calculations and in situ observations. So that's what we're working on right now with the X-Band uh, in the UK. And the one thing that we're trying to do is extend this and actually provide uncertainty with that, and that's not something that's done a lot. There's been some work on that, but actually being able to say how certain are we that it is wet snow versus rain versus grapple um, and build up PDFs that way. Um, so I have implemented it just a little bit. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put any uh, faith in this. But um, here you can see this is a PPI at three degrees um, from the island the, where the radar was sitting. And along this red line is where I've cut through the, the volume radar data and made these, these R, pseudo RHI plots. So you have a 
reflectivity over there, the ZDR, and this is the kind of the map of hydro meteors. And I'm not going to go into the details of it because I don't quite believe it, but you can start to see that you know it might. It, you can start to see the features of this storm. Um, you, you do have a, a core of of grapple or hail. It's raining below the melting level, and there's ice above. So hopefully I can get this fully implement, implemented and we can go through and actually build up the statistics of the storms and work with the colleagues that actually measured the aerosols and try to categorize these and look at the intensities and the formation of ice in these clouds. So um, extending from that, and I just want to, this is a little bit more of an advertisement, is that we're doing a very similar experiment. It's ongoing in the UK. So I had mentioned that you know, the UK radar network is being upgraded and they're doing similar polar metric analysis now, finally. They're doing these hydrometer maps with their network. I have a student working with them on that. Um, but you know, this is the Chibolton Observatory, so this is the X-band radar down here. That's the big dish. Um, when it arrived down there, there's the FAM. Um, and we have a setup in the UK where they actually the FAM can fly from its home base in Cranfield over here uh, and go down the Chibolton and do lines here. This is really busy airspace, so you can imagine with Heathrow not very far away, um, that it's pretty remarkable to be able to get this done. Um, so right now we're waiting for the correct weather to come through and hopefully we can get all the instruments pointing in the same direction and have the Met Office radars going as well. There are a couple in this region and we can do quadruple wavelength polar metric analysis of large frontal wintertime storms that are coming through this area. That's, that's the big project that's going on. It's got kind of a multi-year long-term project um, for NCAS and myself. All right, so I've talked longer than I should have, um, and I just wanted to this, I just wanted to put these up. I think these are these are the things I think about a lot when I'm not thinking about volcanoes here at NCAR, um, and how do you actually you know distinguish phase? How do you identify populations of hydrometeors, and how do you use all that information to actually quantify rainfall rates? Um, and looking towards the future of instrument development and thing and being able to use these observations with models. Now, I stole this from the IPC a couple years ago, but I think it's still pertinent, and I'm still thinking about it, and how can we actually push you know, the scales of what we're measuring um, you know, towards this corner. You know, we're nowhere near here, and you know, the models are doing us with the observations, especially with the radar, um, and how can we actually make new instruments that will help be able to you know, work uh, with models to improve our understanding of uh, cloud processes. So I'm going to... Leave it with that. I'm not going to go over the summary. I do want to thank everybody in my group, um, especially Robert Stillwell. Uh, he has been, this is the one time I've ever caught him sleeping. Um, this is at Summit Greenland. Uh, and he's been a big help with Capable and our new instrument, our new LIDAR that I haven't mentioned yet called Super, which actually measures temperature and water vapor. So it'll help out some of these measurements where we're missing high resolution temperature and water vapor measurements. Mike O'Neill has worked with me for years, uh, building capable and super and working on keeping the lidars and instruments running. Lindsay Bennett is actually the one that makes the X-band radar work. I don't actually ever touch it. She keeps it running. David Dustin just became, just graduated with his thesis uh, this last summer, and now he's, so he's Dr. David Dustin. He's a postdoc in our group. And I have yet to catch my two new students and get good pictures of them. The ben Pickering is out right now putting gastrometers across the UK to work with the Met Office, and Freya has been working with the the big dish down in Chibolton and making ice water content measurements. So I probably I don't think there are any students in the room, but if the, if you guys know any students, um, we always have master projects available and we have a PhD opportunity for anybody who wants to come uh, live in the UK. So cheers. So, uh, Ryan, I'm surprised that you would see oriented ice crystals frequently if it requires relatively non-turbulent conditions in ice clouds. It just seems like there would be mechanisms of turbulence generation happening all the time. So is that the only way that they can occur? No, uh, I think that's, that's, that was a preconception that I brought to this whole project that I thought we need, didn't need turbulence, and I think I don't think turbulence matters. I think that the scale that orientation happens is much smaller than the actual turbulent scales of the cloud, but I can't prove that. Okay. That makes sense. 
I think I think I think if the crystals want to orient orientate, they will orientate, and you know they will because this is it's a different scale from the, the, the larger scale motions of the cloud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, that is actually something I don't understand, and I I would love to work with somebody that we could actually get some measurements on that because you would think they would tumble and flip. But I think there's an article by a guy named Cho or Chu back in 1983 did a lot of analysis, mathematical and showed that turbulence really doesn't unorient them, like you were saying, because the turbulence is on a scale such that it, it can't can't all of these particles. And if you want to see a lot of nice, candid, and oriented ice particles, you should come and take a look at my S-pole data, because we can show you scads of it. We can show you a lot of places where the particles are oriented, we're assuming, because of the aerodynamic effect and gravity, and then we also can show you where the particles are canted off like this, and there's only one mechanism that I know that would take and cant your particles like that, and that's electric field. So I have all this evidence of uh, electric field and then of, of ice. Almost every convective storm you see, if you get up you know, away from the, uh, the convective store out toward where the anvil starts to begin, you always see oriented ice crystals, one way or another. Could you uh, explain again what diattenuation is? The person to ask is sitting behind you, actually. <laughs> huh? It's just the optical version of ZDR. The optical version of the ZDR? Yeah, I mean, it's preferential scattering for polarization. So there is it now. I, I should know this because I wrote a paper on it. But what's the difference then between the back scatter and then from the propagation? I thought diattenuation was. Was, was something that happened on propagation, or is that another term? No, it's, it's, we only really see scattering effects. So the propagation we stuff, right. Effects. We don't really see that happen optically. Okay. And I've actually almost called it in talks before or ZDR, but it didn't get everything just confusing. I'm still trying to work on bringing my LIDAR world together with my radar world, the terminology. Uh, Ryan, yeah. um, so on, on, on those days when the, the whole of uh, Greenland uh, melted, can you explain maybe a little bit more what were the conditions there to, to make it happen? So I, if you remember, I, you probably don't remember, but the U.S. had this huge heat wave during 2012. There were these the significant conditions. It was just a huge amount of heat that uh, had come up from down south uh, and started, it flowed up towards Greenland. Um, and there wasn't much moisture associated with it. So there's a paper by Don Neff, or Bill Neff, uh, that has shows the evidence for this. Um, and, and then along, during that day, there was this a huge deck of clouds over Greenland. Well, why did that, where were they, where did they come from? Is that, is that what you're wanting me to say? Or what, or what, I'm not trying what you're curious about. The, you, oh, were, yeah. you were describing the, the specifics oh, of yeah, what yeah, the yeah. clouds were. So yeah, so. All right, so the observed clouds we saw had this very specific range of liquid water path. So this, this is kind of a sensitivity diagram here. So this is a liquid water path from 0 to 100. Um, and we did this sensitivity analysis of temperature. So you have a range of above freezing 1 to negative 3. And in this range of clouds is the only way you can actually get anything that would put you above, above freezing at the surface. So anything higher than that, you block too much radiation that's coming in, so you can't heat the surface. And if you think too thin, doesn't block enough of the long wave radiation and keep the surface warm. So, which is a big problem with the larger models because they tend to make all the clouds too thick and too small, whereas these are much more widespread. They put out all the water vapor over a, far, a, a bigger area. So, it's the problem of being like too bright, right? That's the problem with most climate models. Any more questions? Let's thank Ryan.